And Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her. The queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called to Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. And Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. And Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explained it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and uh, commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go. Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on behalf, on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai then went and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Well, all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, this um, is your word, and these are your people. And my prayer is simply that you might connect the two together by the power of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, um, we have come in here today to hear from you, not the clever words of man. And so I pray that you might do that. And now, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and what we are not make us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, in chapter 1, we saw the hidden God, the fact that all God is always present even though we don't see him. And then in chapter 2, we looked at the mysterious providence of God, that God is doing things we don't understand. Then in chapter 3, we saw the recurring providence of God, the fact that God himself is always present, um, saving his people from imminent destruction. Then in chapter 4, we now see the timely providence of God, the reality that we must be ready to act when God revealed it. To us, And from time to time in our lives, isn't that often the case? That God comes to us at a time that's most critical to accomplish his purpose. There was a young woman, probably 1971, that was in the Bahamian airport, and she had a choice to make. Her choice was to go back to Jamaica and be with her family, or the choice that she had was to stay in the Bahamas, where she had no family had no friends. 
Well, I'm certainly glad she decided to stay in the Bahamas because a Jamaican man would be behind this, de uh, this podium preaching to you today. That woman was my mother. And there was a time in her life when she was at a crossroads. And the Holy Spirit spoke to her and told her to stay in the Bahamas. And I'm certainly, like I said, glad that she did. And maybe there are some of you inside here today that's at a crossroad in your life. Maybe you're a graduating senior, or maybe you are trying to figure out, should I marry the person that I'm dating? Or, or maybe you're trying to figure out um, something along the lines of what job should I take or what trajectory should I go in life? You know, this chapter of Esther has a lot to say about that, but the focus isn't necessarily on us this morning, it's on Esther, because not only is Esther chapter 4 the most important chapter in the book of Esther, it's also a monumental uh, event that's taking place in Esther's life. Esther, of course, is at a defining moment in her life, and she has to make a decision. I want to look at this defining moment in Esther's life in two ways. First of all, Mordecai calls on Esther to consider God's timely providence. And secondly, Mordecai, uh, Esther responds to God's timely providence. The first, Mordecai calls on Esther to consider God's timely providence. Look at verse number 12 and 4. These are, like I said, some of the most important verses in the entire book, but in many ways, in the entire word of God. Esther, uh, most people look at verse number 14, 15, and 16, and they say, you know, uh, Mordecai is really putting it on Esther. You know, he's using a guilt trip, or he's using fear that she, uh, she might die. But if you actually read the text and understand what's being said, he's not trying to guilt Esther into anything. He's not trying to use fear. In fact, the exact opposite. He's trying to invite Esther to become a part of God's kingdom purposes. He's inviting Esther to be a co-laborer with the king of kings and lord of lords. You say, Pastor Dennis, how can you see this from the text? Well, remember in chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3, I mentioned the majority of the verbs that are used to describe Esther was in the passive form. What that means is this. Everything was being done to Esther. Esther was being carried from where she lived. She was being carried into the king's palace. She was being brought into the harem. Over and over again, these passive verbs are being used, indicating that she's a passive participant in God's kingdom. But lo and behold, by the time we come to chapter 4, guess what happens? All the verbs switch. No more are they passive verbs, but all the verbs become active verbs. Why is that, you might say? Because she is being called to be an active participant in God's kingdom. John Piper says, this is how we know we live in an all-embracing, all-pervasive, invincible providence of God. The fact that God invites each and every one of us to be co-laborers in his kingdom purposes. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. You know, when I was a little younger, uh, I was in a, a little orchestra, you know, and I had no musical talent. I couldn't blow anything. I couldn't play anything. I couldn't do anything. So people like me, you know what job they gave me? Triangle. And you know, when, you're, when you have the triangle, you need to wait, and then your turn comes, ding, and then your turn comes, ding, and that's all of us in here today. All of us are a part of God's great orchestra, and we're being asked to participate in God's glorious kingdom. And in here, Esther's time had definitely come. Now, I want to show you two things underneath this heading, and it's this. You know, um, he's not telling Esther, you have to do this or you die. He's actually inviting Esther into being and making, uh, making an appeal to Esther to become a part of God's 
covenant kingdom. I'm an active member of God's covenant kingdom. And you see that in two ways. Again, notice with me in chapter 4, verse 12, he appeals to Esther's head. Verse number 14, it says, uh, sorry, verse number 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do you think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews? You see that word, do you think? That's a Hebrew idiom. It means simply, do you imagine? In other words, here is what uh, Mordecai is telling Esther. He says, Esther, do you, do you imagine that you've come here by luck? You know, Esther's probably thinking to herself, well, wait a minute. Um, a lot of good things have happened to me in my life. Up to this point, uh, even though my parents died, I got adopted. Up to this point in my parents' life, uh, up to this point in my life, I've been brought into the palace. I've had a great life up to this point. Maybe I will escape all of this. And Mordecai says, Esther, why don't you consider your life for a moment? Why don't you think for a moment? Do you think that all of this happened by luck? Do you think that it just so happened you were born a Jew? Do you think it just so happened that you were taken as the king's wife? Do you think it just so happened you, bo you were born into the palace? Do you think it was a coincidence that the lots that they cast was 12 months out and not two months out? Esther, look at your life. Do you think it all happened by luck? The answer to that question is no. You know, one of the things about our society today, and we've used this a lot, is that we talk about luck, coincidence, and chance quite a bit. But I want to tell you today, our lives are not governed by luck, coincidence, and chance. It's governed by the hand of God. I love what R.C. Sproul said. He said, in a universe governed by God, there is no chance event. Indeed, there is no such thing as chance. Chance does not exist. It is merely a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. But chance itself has no power because it, is, it has no being. Chance is not an entity that can influence reality. Chance is nothing. And that's what Mordecai is telling Esther. Do you think for a moment where you are is a result of chance? You know, one of the things about preaching on the doctrine of God's providence, many of you have come to me and told me bits of your story. And every time you tell me a bit of your story, you marvel at how God has saved you, redeemed you, and helped you. And in the process of doing that, you begin to understand that your life is not the result of time, matter, and chance, but the result of the purposeful and intentional action of a holy God. And let me tell you this, when you get to that point, you begin to ask the critical question that all of us should ask. If that is the case, Pastor Dennis, then what for? What for? I was uh, reading a sermon by uh, Charles Spurgeon. I wish I could have just gotten up here and read his sermon to you because it was so much better. But, but I will read just a portion of the sermon to you because here's what Spurgeon says at this juncture. He said, and this is kind of long, so please forgive me. I'll try to read sort of fast. But here's what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, consider you have been instructed in the faith in a time when unbelief is rampant. What for? You have been entrusted with talent in a time when multitudes are perishing for lack of knowledge. What for? You are found in a church where valued brothers are dying, off, uh, dying or moving off. Why is this? You have wealth when many are starving. Why is this? You hold a high position when many do not. Why are you placed where you are. And here is how Spurgeon clinches it all. He said, brothers, your inevitable answer must be that God has put you where you are for some good purpose, which purpose must be connected with his own glory and with the extension of his kingdom in the world. Wow, 
praise God. Praise God. Most of you in this room were born American. What for? Most of you in this room were born into a middle class family. Why is that? Most of you have been privileged to have education. In fact, for most of us in this room, we will be educated beyond our capacity to learn. Why is that? For most of us in this room, we were given wealth far beyond what we ever thought possible. The question is, why is that? Do you think that's by accident or chance? Some of you hold high positions in your job. For what purpose? Some of you were born men. Why? Women, for what purpose? (laughs) I think Spurgeon is right. At some point in our life, we have to ask the question. If we see the beautiful hand of God on our lives, it's not enough for us just to recount what God has done. The next step in your development is to ask the critical question, for what purpose? I think it's Socrates who put it well, the unexamined life is not worth living. I spent some time with uh, some young men on Wednesday morning. Some of them are in here today. And we talked about the fact that many people in our society, you know, it's one thing that we don't do enough. We don't spend time reflecting. We go from one thing to another. We do one thing to another. But most of us don't take about 30 minutes to an hour every day just to sit down and reflect on your life and what God is doing in your life. Because when you do that, you begin to scratch at the surface of what God really wants us to do, to ask the critical question, what for? For what purpose? It's a glorious reality when we see it like that. So that's the head. That's the head. Now notice the heart. Verse number 14. You know, he, uh, uh, Mordecai looks at Esther and he says, uh, Esther, do you imagine that your life, of course, in verse number 13, do you imagine your life is a result of chance and that by chance you'll escape? Not a chance. But then in verse number 14, he says, for if you keep silent at this time. Now again, that's another Hebrew idiom. And, and one of the things the Hebrew idiom here is trying to get at is this. Esther, consider for a moment what God is not only calling you to do, but what you must do. This is the emotional appeal. This is him getting at the heart. Esther, think about your life and what God has done for you now. Look and see what he is calling you to do. Uh, When I was growing up, um, my mother used to watch the Oprah Winfrey show. Anybody ever watched the Oprah Winfrey show? If your birth certificate is like 95 and up, you might not know. But but for the rest of us, we grew up watching the Oprah Winfrey show. And, and And the reason why the show became so popular was because of this just one moment that happens in all of the shows where she'll be talking to someone you know, and there they have a wall up, and then Oprah would ask them a few questions, and then all of a sudden they'll break down and start crying. And it became so popular, they called it the what? Oprah moment. Well, this is the Holy Spirit moment right now in this passage. This is the Holy Spirit's moment. And now he asked her the first question, consider your life, and now he's following up. Consider that now is the time to act. And notice how, notice how God's providence and human action come together. It starts with the appeal, but notice down in verse number 14, he also says this, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Some of you might have a version that says, who knows you have been made the queen for such a time as this. Anybody have that in their Bible? Their Bible says you've been made a queen. All of you are good Presbyterians. You have ESV probably. 
But, uh, but, but if you have the NLT, not, nothing wrong if you have the NLT or the message or any of those other things. But, but here's what I want to say. God's providence doesn't negate human action. It actually invites it. You know, some of us might think that God's providence ad- is at variance with human action. Well, if God is sovereign, why do I need to do anything? Isn't he going to accomplish his will? If God is sovereign, why do I need to pray? If God is sovereign, why do I need to witness? If God is sovereign, why do I need to serve in my local church? If God is sovereign, why do I need to give my money to the, to the things of the Lord? Well, this, this passage shows us. This passage shows us. The sovereignty of God is not at odds with human action. Esther is being asked to act at a time Why? Because God has made her for this time. Some of you all probably know um, the famous speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I Have a Dream. What a lot of people don't know is he wrote another speech that's equally as uh, monumental, and it's called the Mountaintop Speech. And he gave it um, to a group of sanitation workers. Now, let me just say, I don't know what you think of Dr. King. It doesn't matter. He was flawed, just like all of our heroes are flawed. But I would encourage you to read that speech. And here's why. Right at the beginning of the speech, he says, I could imagine God coming to me and asking me, what, where would you want to live? What period would you want to live in? And he says, I could see my mind going to the ancient civilization of Egypt and all the wonders that happened there, or the ancient civilization of Greece and all the great things that happened there and the Roman Empire. And of course, during the times of the Emancipation Proclamation, he goes on and on. But at the very end of that section, he says this, that I would look at God and said, God, I would want to be born in the 20th century during this time. And then Dr. King says, because as broken and sick and as flawed as my times are, I realize you have ordained me to be in them. Now, just for reference, the very next day, Dr. King was assassinated. Now, here's the point that Dr. King's making, and I don't want any one of you to miss it. You were created by God for this time. Yes, our times are broken. Yes, our times are flawed. But you know what? If God wanted you to be born in a time that wasn't broken and flawed, he would have done it. But each and every one of us are in here today by the exact providence of God. He wanted you to be born in this time. And he wanted you to be born for a purpose to be accomplished in our day. And if you miss this clear point of reality, then I think you're missing the point of why you even exist. You were born for such a time as this. And I hasten for all of us to realize that isn't it the case that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born at the exact time that God intended. Notice what uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive the adoptions as son. If our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born at the exact time that God intended to accomplish the exact purpose to which he was sent, how much more you and I? You know, there's some people that want to withdraw from our culture because they think that it's irredeemable. And there's some people that may not want to participate in our culture because they think it's too far gone. Well, I want to ask you to change your perspective just a little bit. God wants to use you in a very powerful way in the here and now to be light in darkness. And so consider with me that you were born here for such a time as this. Now look at how Esther responds. She responds in three ways by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we'll end with this. 
Uh, Esther hears Mordecai. And she doesn't say, well, you know what, Mordecai, that's a great speech, thank you, but I'm just going to continue down the path that I'm going. That's not what she says at all. I want you to notice three things that happened to Esther as a result of what Mordecai told her. And by the way, this is not Esther, uh, you know, resolving in her mind that she's just going to do this. This is an evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit, even in the Old Testament. I know you don't see it much. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned much. But the Trinity is always present in the Bible. You can never have the Father without the Son and the work of the Holy Spirit. So even in this passage, you see the Holy Spirit working in Esther to do three things. First of all, Esther moves from being a a passive participant in the kingdom of God to an active member of the kingdom of God. Notice with me in verse 16a. Immediately, Esther says, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on uh, on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days and three nights. If you remember at the beginning of this passage that I read, Esther didn't even want to go in front of the king. She was too scared. But now Esther has moved from a passive participant in the kingdom of God to an active member of the kingdom of God. And notice with me, she calls for prayer. Actually, she calls for a fast. Now, in the Bible, whenever you see fast, you need to assume prayer because they go together. And the wonderful thing about this passage is anytime you see prayer and fasting in the Bible, isn't it always after the calamity and not before? And so when you read this passage, you notice that prayer and fasting happens before the calamity and not after. There's a reason for that. That's because now Esther has taken on the role of an intercessor. She's interceding on behalf of her culture and her society. And you know, that's what you and I are called to do as well. You know, so often we think that if we can't do anything substantial, then we can't do anything at all. When the word of God clearly says that prayer is the most powerful weapon that we have against the forces of evil. Prayer. Prayer. And that's what Esther employs. Secondly, notice that Esther goes from being timid to being bold. 16b. It mentions here that that Esther says, Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. Before Esther said, No, I can't go. I'm out of favor with the king. And now she's saying, absolutely, I will go before the presence of the king. Now, let me pause here and say this. There are some of us that think, when I say she goes from timid to being bold, meaning she is not fearful. Oh, no. Esther is very much fearful. And let me make this point very clear to each and every one of us. The exercise of faith doesn't mean the absence of fear. But the exercise of faith means this, that we value the work of the Lord far beyond our own fear. That's what's being seen here. Esther doesn't become bold, and she has no feeling and caring at all. In fact, the exact opposite. Esther understands what's at stake, and she's willing to go anyway. And you see that in the very last thing, where Esther goes from preserving her own life to a willingness to lose her life. She says, if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. This is Esther exercising faith. She's saying, from all human perspectives, I think I'm going to die. But the fact that I'm asking you to pray for me shows that I'm willing to trust the Lord in this moment. And I love this portion of Esther. Because this is what all of us are called to do. That in this moment in redemptive history, God's people are called to exercise faith in our Lord. Now, the last thing I want you to see is this. Esther says that I might die because my personal relationship with the king is is in doubt. He hasn't called on me in 30 days. And yet, you will notice that Esther's relationship with the king of kings is still intact because she's asking for people to go into his presence. You know the glorious thing about our faith, about our Savior, about God? 
the scepter is always held out to his people. The scepter is always held out to us. That while King Ahasuerus has a limit on the amount of people that would come before him, King Jesus stands up and says, I have a different rule. All who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. In fact, King Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the difference between the earthly kings of this world and the king of kings. The invitation is always open to each and every one of us to participate in his kingdom and to come to know him as Lord and personal Savior. You know, what's interesting to me, and I'll close with this, is that this is a time in Esther's life where she thinks that she's going to die. And yet, Esther still is, still is willing to go for it. And the question in my mind is why? Why would she sacrifice everything for her people, knowing full well that she was going to die? Here's what I think was going on in Esther's mind. I think Esther truly said to herself <coughs> that if I die, at least I'll know that I died doing the will of God. It's the same mindset that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Do you remember them? They said, oh, king, I might die, but you know what I won't do? I won't compromise what God has told us to do. And I think that's us. May we as God's people do that in this time that we are called to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the message of the gospel. That each and every one of us were brought here for such a time as this. That in the grand reality of the kingdom, we're all given a task and we're all called upon to fulfill that task. And it's all a measure of your grace. And I, I just pray for all of us that we might be mindful that we were placed here for such a time as this. That we would consider our own life, as Spurgeon said, and what you have called us to do. And that we might become an active participant in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.